I see that we are at the time for our next session. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Uh, and Zan for your leadership and Adrian for creating the uh, wonderful uh, um, electronic campus. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here with my colleagues, Francesca and uh, Hazel, who I've known for a very long time. Um, so um, Thomas has uh, invited us back again. Uh, we hope that we can uh, fulfill your expectations. And we really want to thank Kinemexum uh, for uh, their support. Um, so I'm just going to give a little background about the mitochondria so we can get right on to the presentations. Uh, Hazel uh, is the uh, director of research, uh, research Society Profit Network, and she's going to talk uh, about uh, repairing mitochondrial structure to restore ATP production. And uh, Francesca is the founder and CSO of Pano Therapeutics, and she's going to talk about addressing complex diseases of aging, targeting mitochondrial ion channels with insights in metformin's action. And then they've allowed me to uh, talk just a little bit about uh, some of the things that might be uh, important. Oh boy, that wasn't what I want to do. Um, important in looking at uh, how we might address um, our degenerative diseases. And right now I'm looking for a point. There we go. Okay, uh, so let's begin. So what we're going to do is talk to you about how mitochondria might be a central factor in the aging process and uh, as an important factor in degenerative diseases. And uh, why might we be interested in mitochondria when everybody in the world has spent most of their time interested in this little blue thing called the nucleus? Well, actually, a very large percentage of your, of your cells involve these uh, red things, uh, and they are called mitochondria. And the mitochondria generate most of the energy for your cell. And uh, the difference between being alive and dead is whether there's a flow of energy through your body. So uh, we think that studying mitochondrial energy is extremely important. And mitochondria, as you can clearly see from this electron micrograph, are little bacteria that live inside your cell. So you have a colony of bacteria that live inside your cell. And what's interesting about these bacteria is like any other bacteria, they have their own DNA and the DNA is transcribed into RNA and the RNA is translated onto uh, into proteins by mitochondria-specific ribosomes. And these ribosomes are sensitive to chloramphenicol, a classic bacterial inhibitor. The proteins are initiated by N-formal methionine, as are bacterial ribosomes. And uh, the mitochondrial DNA codes for 13 critical polypeptides. And what do those polypeptides do? Well, they're critical components of generating energy in your body. And those energy generating systems are in what we call complexes. And you'll hear a lot about these complexes. Complex one or NADHD hydrogenase, complex three, the BC1 complex, complex four, cytochrome C oxidase, and complex five, the ATP synthase. <clears throat> the mitochondrial DNA, like any power plant, it codes for the wiring diagram of the power plant. So it codes for the key electron and proton carriers that allow generation of energy complex one to CoQ to complex three to cytochrome C to complex four. And then the stored energy from that is used by the ATP synthase, to make ATP from ADP and phosphate, which then is used as a chemical carrier to uh, do all the work that your body does. In addition to uh, the genes in the mitochondrial DNA, the nucleus of the cell encodes between one and 2000 uh, proteins that are also involved in assembling the mitochondria. And those are very equivalent to, say, the city manager's office that has the diagrams for building the power plant, whereas each power plant must have its own uh, electrical circuit diagram, which is internal to the power plant. And that's exactly the system we have in ourselves. So the mitochondria then is really a eubacteria. Um, it was formed from a symbiont symbiosis about two billion years ago, and it became specialized in energy formation. And the nuclear cytosol was from another kind of bacteria, an archaeobacteria, and it's become specialized in encoding structure. So the mitochondria then uh, generates energy by uh, these uh, structures inside the cell called the mitochondria. It's a double membrane structure, and it has these unfolded structures called Christi. And these Christi, it turns out, is where most of the exciting energy production is made. And if you look at this uh, mitochondria um, in a a tomogram from electron microscope uh, from, in this particular case, a um, heart cell, what you can see 
is that the Christi of the adjacent mitochondria are aligned with each other. And that means that the mitochondria are communicating with each other in real time. And they're communicating through the fact that as the mitochondria um, uses the electron transport chain to pump protons uh, out from the mitochondrial matrix, the inside of the mitochondria, to the uh, Christi lumen, uh, it makes a very high concentration of protons in a sealed structure called the Christi lumen. And these structures then are very, very thin layers between these two membranes, which have all of this positive charge. So they're an extremely high potential electrostatic system. And so basically what we have are these Christi lumen with all the protons pumped inside uh, the lumen. And then the ATP synthase is arranged along the outside where the maximum electrostatic potential is condense ADP and phosphate. And the electrostatic potential, we believe, between the adjacent mitochondria is what caused the mitochondrial Christi to align and to interact with each other. So this uh, system then can have uh, genetic diseases that result from variants in the nuclear DNA or variants in the mitochondrial DNA. And uh, many of you, I'm sure, are well familiar with changes in the nuclear DNA, so I thought I'd mention some of the changes that might be seen in the mitochondrial DNA. So this is a family we saw in the, um, I guess this was the, uh, hmm, um, early 1980s, I guess. Um, and uh, this uh, mother brought her uh, two sons together. Uh, one son was in her arms and was uh, pretty much unresponsive. The other son was walking along, bumping into the walls. This child had cerebellar ataxia, and this child had what we call Lee syndrome, a lethal childhood disease. And the mother had another child from a different husband that had, had Lee syndrome and died, which is why she had come to us so upset. Um, and when we examine the eyes of the mother and her mother and her half sisters from another marriage, we saw that their retina had this black staining material, which is called uh, spicular retinitis pigmentosa. The macular was degenerating. Um, and so they were developing retinitis pigmentosa. And they had a brother who was in the arrest nursing home. And when uh, he was examined, the brain by MRI at only a third the volume of the cerebellar, cerebellum, which is involved in motor control, and only half the volume of the um, stem, the pons and the uh, olive, uh, which are very important in connecting your brain to uh, the rest of your body. And it turned out that this family had a mutation in the mitochondrial DNA at nucleotide position 8993. It changed a single nucleotide to T to G, it changed a protein in this enzyme that makes ATP, ATP synthase, from a leucine to an arginine. And that change was very important because the change then uh, converted this leucine to a positively charged arginine. And this protein forms a uh, bridge across the inner membrane for the protons to move through uh, the inner membrane, drive the synthesis of ATP, and it needs this neutral leucine so that the proton can get together with this negatively charged glutamate and go through into the mitochondrial matrix. With this mutation, a possibly charged arginine forms a salt bridge and blocks the formation of energy. And so it turns out that these children that all uh, ultimately died of this disease, had a very high number of their mitochondrial DNAs in each cell mutant. So each cell has hundreds to thousands of mitochondrial DNAs. And when we have a mixture of two different mitochondrial DNAs, we call that heteroplasma. So in these children, they had almost all of their mitochondrial DNAs mutant, and that reduced their energy and made them uh, very, very sick and died. Whereas all of the individuals that when, uh, were uh, having retinitis pigmentosa, they only had 75% of their mitochondrial DNAs mutant. And this young uh, poor gentleman with a very severe neurological disease was intermediate with 80 to 90%. So simply changing the percentage of energy deficiency resulted in a wide range of clinical symptoms. So it turns out that mitochondrial DNA has a high, very high mutation rate and is exclusively maternally inherited. And so what we've been able to do is sequence the mitochondrial DNA from populations around the world. And since we know that the only way for mitochondrial DNAs to change is by mutation, by comparing the sequences of the mitochondrial DNAs of different populations, we can actually reconstruct their genetic relationship. And knowing where the aboriginal populations uh, arose, we can actually reconstruct the migration of women. 
So we have then a population of people that arose in Africa about 100, 200,000 years ago and radiated in Africa, giving what we call L lineages. And then only two mitochondrial DNAs left Africa to colonize the rest of the world. One lineage called M stayed in the tropics all the way down to Australia. And the other lineage, M, moved into the temperate zone to give rise to these European lineages and then laterally into Asia to give rise to other Asian lineages. And then later, some of the M lineages moved into the temperate zone to give rise to new mitochondrial DNA lineages. And then lineages A, C, and D of, uh, in uh, Siberia crossed the Bering Land Bridge to colonize the Americas. Now, what we've shown is that this variation allowed our ancestors to adapt their energy metabolism, to live in either tropical region or in the temperate zone region or in the Arctic. And that changed then mitochondrial energy metabolism to allow adaptation to different environments. And this is just an example of studies we did uh, in an Asian population where these mitochondrial lineages we call haplogroups are associated with uh, protection against diabetes. Uh, this lineage has uh, increased risk for hypertension. This risk has increased risk for obesity. But also these mitochondrial lineages can be involved in neurological diseases. So these mitochondrial lineages in Europe are all increased risk for um, autism. And most important for this conference, uh, these mitochondrial lineages, European lineage J, uh, lineage J2 and U3, and a particular mitochondrial variant, and in Asia, lineage D, these are all correlated with increased longevity. So changing mitochondrial variation also affects energy metabolism, but also affects longevity. So how could mitochondrial DNA variation have any effect on longevity? Well, it turns out that you're born with a certain number of normal mitochondrial DNAs in each cell. As uh, you age, you accumulate mutations in some of those mitochondrial DNAs, and that results in their uh, damage and loss of energy. So here as young mouse, all these are normal length mitochondrial DNAs. In an old mouse, we see many mitochondrial DNA deletions. Or in humans, young uh, humans all have normal mitochondrial DNA, plus older humans have accumulated mitochondrial DNA damage. And as we accumulate mitochondrial DNA damage over time, we erode the number of power plants in our cells that generate energy. So our energy declines, and as our energy declines, it crosses the minimum energy for each of our organs, which we call the bioenergetic threshold. And then those organs have an energetic decline and failure, and that gives symptoms. And it turns out that the organs that are most sensitive to energy deficiency are the central nervous system, the heart, the muscle, the endocrine, and the renal systems, all the ones that are commonly involved in energy. So you get born with an energy capacity, which can be either good or bad, then you erode that energy further with these somatic mutations and cross the energy thresholds. And that's why we get age-related disease. And we can prove that by making a mouse in which we take an enzyme catalase that removes oxygen radicals from the mitochondria. And we can target this uh, catalase into the mitochondria. And when we do that, we get a mouse that can live 20% longer and it has only half of the somatic mutations. So we believe then that this is a key factor in the aging, in aging and age-related diseases. So once you decide to put energy in the middle of, um, of medicine instead of anatomy, as it currently is, then you can see that all of the common diseases, the neuropsychiatric, cardiac, muscle, renal diseases, all have the same pathophysiological mechanism, reduction in energy. And this can occur because you can have mutations in nuclear genes or changes in their expression, you can have alterations in the mitochondrial DNA, these ancient polymorphisms that allowed our ancestors to adapt to environments or recent deleterious mutations. Or you can have changes in your diet or how you uh, use your energy or whether you smoke and are intoxicating your mitochondria. If you diminish energy, you diminish mitochondrial replication, you accumulate these somatic mutations, and that gives you aging and age-related degenerative diseases. The first organs that are affected are the neuropsychiatric, cardiac, muscle, and renal. If you block um, the function of the uh, power plant and you continue to add um, uh, energy resources, uh, which are carbohydrates and fat, accumulate in your body, and that accounts for diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. And since the mitochondria are basically bacteria, if there is not enough energy, the cell will lice release the bacteria in the bloodstream, and that initiates the inflammatory response, which is why all of these cell diseases 
have an inflammatory component. And finally, cancer is all about adjusting energy to have enough energy for the cells to grow. So I'd like to then leave this story where it is and transfer our um, product, our, assist, our <laughs> organizational meeting over to Hazel, if she would like to give a presentation. Hey, good morning, uh, Doug. That was an amazing introduction and you've made my life much easier now. So I'm going to try to share screen and do you all see this okay? Oops. Did I, quite. Can you see it? Nope, sorry, Hazel. No, I but. think that I think that the uh, Bronte might have uh, helped me share, but I think it's because she thought that I was after Doug. So if you can actually connect Hazel instead of me, I have the share screen ability. Can you try? Well, I I am on shared screen. Oh, okay. Uh, if you click the, okay, I'm going to do oh, it again. We can see it now. You can see it. Great. Great. Uh, so, you know, Doug ended up with that perfect slide to lead into my talk um, about how mitochondria dysfunction can account for many of the common chronic diseases. So what I've shown here are basically from the WHO, these are the major non-communicable diseases that accounts for 70% of global mortality. And our hypothesis, just like Doug, is that mitochondrial dysfunction is the root cause of all these diseases. And why is that idea important? It's important because if that is the case, then we should be, if we have interventions that can improve mitochondrial function, it may be able to help with all of these very disparate diseases that are now currently being treated as individual entities by in different specialists using different drugs. Uh, we, we will hopefully be able to get away from polypharmacy because as we age, we're gonna get one of these at least. Uh, as we get older, we'll get two or three of these and then it really damages our quality of life. So, there's been a lot of attention now in the last few years about developing drugs to treat mitochondria dysfunction. And here I've just put down some of the common targets that are being used. So clearly, um, you know, Doug has already indicated the complexity of what happens in the mitochondria. Substrates like fatty acids come in, feeds through the TCA cycle. So Drugs that can improve fatty acid oxidation will improve nutrient supply to the TCA cycle, which would then feed into the electron transport chain. We can try to target drugs that will improve electron transfer efficiency here. One of the oldest things is coenzyme Q. Now, uh, electron leak from the electron chain produces reactive oxygen species. These are damaging and Doug already indicated that as we age, we get more of this because the whole mitochondria function isn't working that well. ROS together with calcium, calcium is a big regulator of mitochondria function. These two overload of both of these would drive the mitochondria permeability transition pole. Uh, and in addition uh, to, all, to trying to target these uh, um, molecular uh, pathways, there's also a lot of attempts now to target mitochondria dynamics, be it fission or fusion. Uh, there's a lot of attempts to try to increase the number of mitochondria with biogenesis. And there's also talk about mitophagy to try to eliminate the damaged mitochondria. So I would like to come uh, propose to you uh, a new target, which, which I consider as very upstream of the other targets that I have mentioned. And that is maintaining the mitochondria Christi. Doug has shown you beautiful structures about what the Christies can do. The idea that Christies you know, carry the electron transport chain, ATP synthase in an enclosed environment is really important. But what you may not realize is actually the inner membrane, the Christi membranes, contains a lot of proteins. About half of the surface area is covered with proteins. So proteins that are anchored to the Christi membranes include all of the 
respiratory complexes, ATP synthase, the enzymes that produce the iron sulfur clusters, uh, and also all of the membranes that import in the metabolites that are important for the electron transport chain to work. Uh, and in addition to that, the mitochondrial ribosomes are anchored to the Christi membrane. So you need that in order to be able to, tra to transcribe uh, and express the mitochondria proteins. Uh, and you go to the other end, um, majority of the proteins are actually imported from the nucleus. So that process also requires proteins that are anchored to the Christi membrane. Uh, and Christi membranes even anchor proteins that are responsible for mitochondria dynamics, fission and fusion, uh, and for mitochondria protein degradation. So um, the surface area of the Christi is what determines how much ATP and a mitochondria can make. And Doug show you uh, an electron mic uh, uh, micrograph of mitochondria from the heart. The cardiomyocyte have really densely packed Christi. So, you know, you may wonder, well, how much ATP do we need? Uh, it's been estimated that a normal adult would require ATP turnover equivalent to their own body weight. And that's just really difficult to fathom when you think about it. You know, burning off 60, 70 kilograms of ATP. So how much, oops, sorry, how much, how many of these Christies do you need to produce that amount of ATP? And Peter Rich in a one page paper in Nature uh, had actually calculated how, how much of a service area would you need to accommodate the proteins that we would need to make that much ATP. And he came up with a number of 14,000 meters square. And for you to visualize it, that's 11 Olympic size swimming pool. Kind of incredible when you think about how all of that is squeezed into our bodies. Um, so what does it take to maintain good Christie structures? And, and this is all made possible because of a very unique phospholipid that only exists on the inner mito mitochondrial membrane and in bacteria. This was of bacterial origin. It is different from other phospholipids in that it's like a dimer. It's like two phospholipids, two, four acyl chains, two phosphate head groups, but the phosphate head groups are held together with glycerol. So it's, you've got a small head, big fan out tails. There are two double, uh, unsaturated double bonds on each tail and you get a conical structure. If you have a lipid environment, and you allow these cardiolipin molecules to come together, they would automatically have be driven to form curvatures. And that's what's needed in order to make these very dense Christi membranes. Now, cardiolipin has been shown that in fact, it is not only important for forming the, the lipid structure, but it actually anchors all these important proteins that I mentioned. Without cardiolipin, even if the proteins are present in mitochondria, they do not achieve optimal uh, function. So it starts off even with cardiolipin synthase for making cardiolipin. If you have, if, if you're deficient in cardiolipin, cardiolipin synthase doesn't work well. None of the respiratory complexes will work well. You cannot form these super complexes, which allows for the most efficient energy transfer. So cardiolipin deficiency will impact all of these protein function. And so it is really important to be able to maintain the cardiolipin health uh, in mitochondria. Now cardiolipin, because of this unique structure, because of this, all these unsaturated double bonds, they are, cardiolipin is really vulnerable to oxidative damage for lipid peroxidation. And of course, cardiolipin is living right in the environment where ROS is surrounding. So peroxidation of these azo chains uh, would lead to degradation of cardiolipin by phospholipases. What I want to really impress upon you here is that while ROS is important, it is not sufficient 
to carry out the cardiolipin peroxidation because cytochrome C actually add, acts as a catalyst for this process. So cytochrome C is a small protein. It's not integral to the membrane, but it is anchored to cardiolipin because it has nine cationic amino acids that will help it electrostatically. It's attracted to the anionic phosphates uh, on cardiolipin. So when it, when it interacts very closely hydrophobically with cardiolipin, it opens up this heme group and it acts as the catalyst. So it's really the heme ion in the cytochrome C that catalyzes the peroxidation of cardiolipin. So Doug mentioned that, of course, mitochondria have two membranes. The inner membrane and what's all inside it is the stuff of bacterial origin, of course, including proteins that are imported in. But there's an outer membrane that serves to protect the cell from all these bacteria components. But when cardiolipin is peroxidized, this now, it allows the oxidized cardiolipin to translocate or to flip to the outer mitochondria membrane. Now it is exposed to the cell. And this now, this, this one step uh, leads to a lot of mitochondrial components as being called mitodamps. These are the danger molecules. So what happens with mitodamps that are released? So what's been the, probably the best known is the fact that when cardiolipin is peroxidized, cytochrome C is released from mitochondria. This now will interact with the apoptosome and initiate apoptosis. But now we also know that cardiolipin peroxidation would lead to mitochondria fission and therefore making little small mitochondria that are re readily eaten up in, by the process of mitophagy. While this might be a good process to get rid of bad mitochondria, losing mitochondria is not always a good thing. And this would have to be compensated by increased biogenesis. A more recent uh, uh, understanding about this oxidized cardiolipin on the outer membrane is that it serves as a docking station for NLRP3 uh, and the other components that in involves in the NLRP3 inflammasome activation. This will ultimately, with activation of caspase-1, would lead to upregulation of IL-1 beta and IL-18 and leads to chronic inflammation. Now, mitochondria DNA, that's a bacterial uh, origin. And when that comes out, can activate, oh, sorry, the sting pathway and leads to interferon, NF-kappa-3 and autophagy. So in, in, in the scheme of all things, what this will all do is decrease function, increase cell death, induce chronic inflammation and causing tissue remodeling. So we were very fortunate to be the first one to identify a compound that selectively target to, mito to mitochondria and to cardiolipin. So what is this? Uh, you will hear about SS31, which is a tetrapeptide. It's got two cationic amino acids, arginine and lysine, and it's got two aromatic rings, and it's alternating in motif. This was dumb luck that we came up with this first. But these peptides are very water-soluble, and yet they penetrate into cells very easily. No transport is needed. And we learned more than 10 years ago that it targets to the inner membrane. Took us a while to understand why it would do that. It turns out it targets to cardiolipin. What it does, and we've sort of sorted this out last year, is that these positive charges are attracted to the phosphate head groups. And then the aromatic rings now dive into the lipid bilayers, but they still stay very surface, like you know, at the interfacial region. But one of the things that it does by doing that is that it pulls the phosphate head groups together, making the distance smaller, and so what it ends up doing is it increases the lipid packing on this side and you end up with a tighter curvature. Uh, now, by doing that, we talk about how cardiolipin is important for anchoring all these proteins. Uh, and Jim Bruce published last year also that 
when he looked at proteins that could be pulled down with SS31, he found eight proteins that are pulled down. Actually, he found a total of 12 uh, and some minor components. But of those 12, eight of them are involved in the ATP synthetic pathway. Uh, and others, all, all, many other studies with isolated mitochondria, with cells, have shown that SS31 can increase the electron transfer. By doing that, you increase phosphate oxygen coupling, increase ATP synthesis. Uh, and concomitant with that, of course, you will reduce electron leak and you reduce ROS production. Uh, now, some of the other things we have learned with Nathan Alder that we published last year is that besides increasing lipid packing curvatures, that what the SS31 does is by binding to the phosphate head groups, we are now reducing the electrostatic charge on the membrane. And so you reduce the amount of calcium, other cations that can bind to the membrane surface, and that is probably one pathway where we had shown 15 years ago that it can reduce mitochondria permeability transition. Uh, the other thing it can explain for is that by, elect by reducing the electrostatic charge, we would reduce the hydrophobic interaction between cytochrome C and cardiolipin and increase peroxidase activity. So that is exactly what we had postulated some years ago. Now, if we, all of this is correct, then I would venture to propose that SS31 can inhibit all of these downstream events due to cardiolipin peroxidation. And I don't have time to show you all the studies, but in fact, through many investigators, all of this has been shown that SS31 can in prevent all of this activation of various forms of cell death and tissue remodeling. So it leads us back to the non-communicable diseases. Uh, and it, it has over the years now, with the help of many investigators, they have done preclinical animal studies to show that SS31 can be beneficial in all of these disease models. Uh, and also in aging. So I've actually been working with Peter Rabinovich and his aging group uh, a lot in the last few years. And to summarize everything that they have found is SS31 can rejuvenate mitochondria function in the aged mouse. Uh, it can even restore the cardiolipin uh, architecture, the Christie architecture and promote tissue regeneration during aging. Now, I don't have time to give credit to everybody who's done work on this, but I will simply highlight three studies that are relatively new that really illustrate some important things. One is Tony Sabah had been doing these studies on with SS31 in dogs with heart failure. Uh, and he's been treating dogs for three months and found that there's beneficial effects on mitochondria function, on gene expression of like circa two, uh, protein turnover, and it can improve substrate metabolism, like flipping back from glycolysis to fatty acid oxidation and myocardial remodeling. But just in the last few weeks, he published a review article which summarized the time course that it takes. And I think this is where it is important to understand. So he says, in all his studies now, putting them together, that mitochondria function, ATP synthesis can improve within hours to days. But it, after following days of treatment, you can get now an upregulation of the healthy gene expression, downregulation of the cytokines. It will improve cardiac and mitochondria protein turnover, especially including circa 2A, uh, and it switches back the cardiac metabolism, and you, you can even reverse the fibrosis. So, but what I want to impress upon you is that this is a time-dependent process. Uh, the other point that Tony brings out in his review is the durability, he calls it, of SS31 effects. And that is that once you have gone through this whole process and you have remodeled the heart, 
then you can stop the drug and the beneficial effects will persist for quite some time. And we can bring it up in discussion perhaps, but this raises serious questions about clinical how clinical trials have to be designed. The other second point I want to raise is also work from Tony Sabah's lab, where you know we talk about drugs and having side effects. The interesting thing about SS31 or elamipratide, is clinical name, is that when you try to treat heart failure, you have benefits in other organ systems, and one of which is the skeletal muscle. And he had shown, this is just one piece of data, where treating heart failing heart failure dogs with SS31 can reverse the switch from type 1 fibers, skeletal fibers, to type 2. Okay, so this is a beneficial side effect. A third, the last one I want to show you is how with all the non-communicable diseases, whether it infect, affects the lungs, the heart, the kidneys, there's always a loss of the microvasculature. And this is a study done uh, with Lilac Lehman's group at Mayo Clinic, where they have looked at pigs uh, in, in, with a metabolic syndrome created by a Western diet for over a three month period. And what they find in the heart and in the kidney, uh, this is micro CT showing the vessels. Uh, and these are mostly the smallest one would be the arterioles, that there is a loss of the vascular tree in both the heart and the kidney. And so this, and she's correlated this with the uh, oxygen tension in the tissues. After four weeks of treatment with elamipratide, it was able to restore the vascular tree. So this is, again, another downstream effect, but it's due to the effect on endothelial cells. And if you can restore the microvasculature, you will be able to maintain the health of the organ. So I will simply finish uh, to say that I hope I can convince you that restoring the mitochondria architecture through protecting cardiolipin has the potential of treating all of these non-communicable diseases with a single agent. Now, that's not to say that SS31 or elamipratide should not be used in conjunction with standard of care. It can be used because it has few, if any, adverse effects. Um, so I will leave it as that, but I think, you know, Doug, I really thank you for introducing this topic uh, and I'd be happy to do discussion later on. Thank you very much, Hazel, for this brilliant presentation. Now um, we get to hear from uh, our colleague, Francesca, and um, then we'll uh, have chance maybe for some discussion later. Francesca? Yes, so I'm gonna help. try to share my screen. Hazel, you have to stop I, sharing. I have to stop. I have to get back to this. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not very good at this. Um, Should be a top. Oh, there. Okay. okay, I'm here. All right. Oh, I, 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 I stopped, right? You're yeah, good. So I'm going to try to share mine now. So you guys tell me if you can see it. Perfect. Can you, now. can you see my screen? Yeah, now just make, excellent. Okay, perfect. Take it away, Francesca. Yeah, so perfect. So guys, thank you very much. Uh, it's amazing two talks. I'm super happy that both uh, Doug and Azel cover uh, as generally as the, you know, the importance of mitochondria and neurodegenerative diseases, aging diseases, and you know, um, very complex diseases of age. So I'm going to try to play the role of a specialist here so that I can focus on my specific um, target and what we care about. So, oops, it's not moving. Hold on. So since uncoupling um, seems to be a recurring uh, favorite theme in the longevity space, and we heard about uh, Jerry Schumann trying to develop uh, liver targeted uncouplers, uh, then there's life biosciences with David Sinclair, they're developing uncoupling for aging. Um, I thought that I may, may, might regress a little bit on this and to pick up from where we left off from Metabizzi 2020 and uh, from this uh, talk that I gave in, back in January. So first and foremost, what is Uncoupling, again, over and over again, is always nice to be reminded, is basically can be defined simplistically by a positive charge that crosses the inner mitochondrial membrane, thus shunting the protomotive force, as you can see here. Uh, just not to be too reductionist, you know, this uh, positive charge doesn't have to be necessarily carried by protons, but it can also be carried by 
potassium and sodium and calcium as we will see later. So as a good reminder, we must uh, remember that shunting, the, the protomotive force reduces the energetic efficiency of mitochondria. So is then uncoupling good or bad? So there are a few examples of bad uncoupling. And unfortunately, even though it's uh, you know, a drug that has been used in the past as a thermogenic uh, protonophore, or DNP, uh, the very mechanism that DNP uses to make us lose weight by sweating, making us sweating at the skeletal muscle is also the very reason why we die by basically stopping and shunting the leptin transport chain at the level of the heart. Uh, there's other form of uncoupling where uncoupling is not good. So cancer cell mitochondria are highly uncoupled and that might be related to the Wurbeck effect. We're not gonna go into the details of this. Uncoupled beta cells cause insulinoma and also hyperinsulinemia. And at least, last but not least, mitochondrial orphan disease are actually example, very good examples of energetic inefficiencies of organs where they rely heavily on OxFOS, which is brain, heart, retina, and skeletal muscle. And what's very relevant about mitochondrial orphan disease is where uh, Doug is an expert. Uh, he was the first person to show that a mitochondrial DNA mutation caused a mitochondrial orphan disease. So what's very relevant about this organ, um, mitochondrial orphan disease is that it can also be considered possibly as proxy um, for biology of aging. So they can basically, we can basically identify patterns in, the, in these outliers like mitochondrial diseases to basically recapitulate some biology of aging. Um, so that's a very interesting uh, space that we um, at PANO we're gonna explore in collaboration with Doug Wallace here. So basically what I'm trying to say is that targeting and coupling might, might, coupling might keep into consideration a few main points. First and foremost, what is the type of ion involved in uncoupling? Uh, again, there's not only protons, but it can also affect you know, um, uncoupling by uh, shunting the protomotive force with potassium and sodium or calcium. And all of these different ions will have slightly different effects on the protomotive force. The second point to consider is the protein and or the specific molecular mechanism involved in a couple. There's not just one bucket that pulls them all in. There's a few different ones, and we'll see one that we're considering in, this, in my company. And again, the target tissue. Um, uh, Gerald Schumann was specifying that they're trying to develop um, uncouplers that are similar to DMP, but specifically to the liver. That's a very good point because FDA will not probably approve a drug that goes, an uncoupler that goes lower the place because that might affect again the heart, the brain, and all the other uh, tissue that highly rely upon OxFOS. So the other famous uh, gear protector and drug that has been suggested to be a protonophore and uncoupler is metformin. And again, this is a review of a famous slide by Mir Barsilai. I know very well everybody has their own favorite uh, target for metformin. We favor this hypothesis that complex one lies uh, at the very top of all this other uh, signaling pathway that might explain most of the pleiotropic effect of metformin uh, downstream of complex one. So the discovery that launched this company is actually that metformin is indeed not a uncoupler, not a protonophore, but it inhibits actually a mitochondrial coupling current uh, mediated by potassium. As you can see here, very briefly, uh, there's metformin, proguanil, and formin. They're more lipophilic than biaguina, they're more potent at this potassium uh, current. And so the reason why we're so extremely confident about uh, making the statement that metformin is not a protonophore is because the only way to directly measure in any electrogenic current across the inner mitochondrial membrane is to apply the mitochondrial patch cans. And I was in the lab for six years where we were doing this. And as you can see here, we have uh, the potassium uh, sodium current that we're studying at PANO. We can actually measure the proton leak mediated by UCP1 in brown fat or um, A and T in skeletal muscle. We can measure the mitochondrial calcium in porter. And even though it's not here because it's not published yet, we can also measure electrogenic current of the inner mitochondrial member mediated by DNP, FCCP, valinomycin, and agerosine. I have one publication of mine from uh, 2010 where we show valinomycin and agerosine being um, uncouplers of the mitochondrial member. So uh, actually, I just a little parenthesis because I'm really proud and honored to have worked in the uh, Department of Physiology UCSF where David Jules won the Nobel Prize a week ago uh, for an ion channel. So I'm really proud and probably he's going to put on the spot ion channels that again. So just a little parenthesis for that. Uh, so 
the discovery, but I'm not going to uh, disclose too much until it's peer review. So this potassium uncoupling current, obviously, the favorite target is associated with complex one. We have a strong pharmacology to show that, and we have preliminary genetics that we uh, did in collaboration with Doug here uh, to show that complex one is very much um, an important uh, component of this phenomenon. And the relevance of this is that basically uncoupling at complex one would decrease efficiency of proton pumping at complex one, thus decreasing energy production uh, generally and probably being very relevant and affecting in aging processes and again, in complex diseases of aging. So uh, the reason why I pull up this slide uh, is to remind people that we shouldn't be use an oversimplified description of complex one and say, if we inhibit complex one in a potent way, we're gonna, you know, uh, it, it has toxic effect because complex one is way much more complex than that. He has 45 subunits, seven of which are coded by the mitochondrial DNA. And of note, as Doug mentioned, there's uh, 13 genes, mitochondrial genes that code for 13 polypeptides. Seven of these 13 polypeptides uh, belongs to complex one. So this is why it's so relevant for uh, energy production in, at the level of the mitochondria. He contributes 40% of the protomotive force and it works, we keep forgetting that, but it works in both forward and reverse mode. So it's not just able to uh, mediate an NADH oxidative reduction activity, but it can also mediate quinol, quinol oxidase activity. Uh, there's another famous phenomenon that Mike Murphy uh, in England studied for a long time, which is red reverse electron transfer, where basically electron goes backward and reduce all the quinol pool, and this might have relevance in conditions like ischemia and perfusion and others. It's a major or the major source of ROS at both forward and reverse mode. There's a lot of publication out there showing that um, complex one can release ROS in both, both ways. And again, there's another forgotten um, way of uh, operating complex one, which is the deactive state, which is catalytically incompetent. There's not just the active form of complex one, there's also an activity incompetent form that has been shown, particularly this publication where they show that metformin preferentially bind to the D state of complex one. Uh, again, there's more than 60 subfamily of inhibitors. Uh, metformin is one of them, but there's also capsaicin, berberine, ridebenone, rotenone. And of course, um, you know, it, it's been very hard so far to classify them because they all do different things. So again, uh, oversimplifying by saying inhibiting complex one is gonna be toxic is not uh, acceptable anymore. We need to go further and study what are the mechanisms of the complex one that might be really relevant for different uh, diseases. Uh, it also has a very important uh, sodium proton exchanger activity, which is evolutionarily highly conserved and comes from bacteria and is uh, mediated by three of his, uh, four of his subunits, uh, transmembrane subunits, which are mitochondrial DNA encoded. So what we're doing at panel and what's relevant to us again, and Thomas asked me to be a little bit more clinical and less and less uh, based biology was to basically show what's out there in the clinics right now that targets complex one. And what are the past mysteries and failures and what we're trying to resolve and try to solve for at panel to make uh, better complex one inhibitors that might be used for complex diseases of agents as well as like specific um, uh, conditions. So the over 60 families of compounds against have um, effects that range from toxic to broad clinical benefits. Compare metformin with rotenone, completely different mechanisms. Uh, metformin, again, binds preferentially to the D-state, uh, and it's called this, the so-called mild and transient inhibition of complex one, which we strongly believe to be associated to this potassium uncoupling current that we're able to record. Uh, so the emerging class of drugs uh, focus on complex one inhibition, as you can see here on the left, at least where complex one inhibition was involved. We have imiglimin with Poxo, uh, which is now, I think, approved in Japan uh, for metabolic and type 2 diabetes. We have Immunomet, um, that it, they are developing a drug that targets complex one, is a metformin, a, a bideline derivative that uh, targets cancer, solid tumors, and fibrosis. There's a compound developing under development at Mayo Clinic, Mayo Clinic CP2 um, uh, for neurodegenerative diseases, specifically Alzheimer. And then there's Novatari that is developing again, um, alternative to metformins for metabolic fibrotic and cancer. Um, on the right, you see the failed uh, phase one trials. Um, so there's an MD Anderson drug, which was very potent inhibitor of complex one uh, that works similarly to rotenone. Uh, there is a Pfizer compound and another uh, Bayer uh, pharmaceutical compound. So what we basically will be trying to do is that 
trying to uh, launch a proof of relevance campaign where we basically want to show where this uncoupling kind is mostly expressed that could uh, constitute a target uh, for new drugs, both for aging uh, conditions as well as specific conditions, like as I mentioned before, the microphones or orphan diseases. Because again, and it's not from my words, uh, I think Matt Keberling, was, which is going to talk later, was mentioning the mitochondrial orphan diseases are extremely relevant because they can be considered as proxy for the biology of aging. It can basically create a framework of knowledge where we can see, uh, you know, uh, what happens in this, with this mitochondrial horrifying mitochondrial DNA uh, mutation that cause, uh, you know, the, all the organs that highly rely on OxFOS to basically age early, like the brain, you see Leach syndrome, lawn, retina, uh, the heart, and skeletal muscle. And this is, of course, in collaboration with drug wars. So at Pano Therapeutics, we have two preclinical programs ongoing. One is on cancer for a pan tumor um, um, activity. And then we have a preclinical for metabolic carbonate disease. And we're moving forward to explore the mitochondrial orphan disease uh, space with uh, DAP. And with this, um, I'm done. And I thank you for my attention. And I head uh, back uh, to uh, hand it back to Doug. So give me a second because I was... Thank you very much, Francesca. That was brilliant. You both did a fabulous job. Uh, Thomas, how are we doing on time? You are we someone... Until, we have until 11.30. Please keep going. This is fabulous. Okay. Um, uh, uh, then I'm going to take just a minute, if you would mind, to uh, uh, share an, another concept. Uh, also uh, very much in line with the... Uh, ideas that you've just heard. So, no, not to get you out of the way. So um, I thought it might be interesting to just mention that there's as a much broader implication of the, the work of these two scientists um, in relation to disease, not just uh, what are called primary mitochondrial diseases, but as uh, Hazel and Francesca mentioned, the idea that there are um, really a very large number of common diseases which have defied understanding uh, and developing good therapeutics, which may in fact be because people have not been thinking about a possible mitochondrial etiology of these diseases. And I'd like to start with a disease called Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. <clears throat> this is a disease due to a mutation in the mitochondrial DNA most common of which is in one of the complex one genes, as Francesca just mentioned. Gene is ND4. It changes nucleotide 11778. It changes an R gene encoded on 340 histidine. Uh, now, this is an interesting disease because all of the patients have pure mitochondrial DNA mutation. So it isn't that they're heteroplasmic and variable. They all have the same mitochondrial DNA mutation. In this pedigree, you can see that everybody that's affected, that is filled, are related through maternal lineage, but not everybody on the maternal lineage is affected. So if the disease was due to pure mitochondrial DNA mutation, how come all of these people escape the disease? Another very weird thing about this disease is that there are four times more males being affected than females. So um, why is it that a common mutation would have such different um, presentation. And I think the lessons that we've learned from studying labors can give us some insight onto the variability of other common diseases. First of all, why are males more affected than females? Well, we believe one reason is that in, uh, in people, there are two estrogen receptors that bind to estrogen. One is called alpha and one is beta. The beta estrogen receptor, about 20 to 30% of it is localized in the mitochondria. And why is that interesting? Because when you add estradiol, you, um, within an hour, you double the antioxidant defenses of the mitochondria. So as uh, Hazel mentioned, uh, much of the damage to the cell and to cardiolipins is due to oxidative stress. So it follows that women who are cycling with estradiol would have much higher antioxidant defenses than men. And that might in fact account for why the women are protected for this disease. It's also an age-related disease having an onset of about uh, mid to, uh, late teens to twenties, hence the younger children uh, are not affected. That still doesn't account for why people in the old age group say these males 
are not affected, whereas these males are. And this is a wonderful work that was done by Valerio Corelli and, and a large number of collaborators in Europe. They actually looked at the mitochondrial DNA cop number in labor's patients, in the blood in this case. And what you look at is controls, you have a relatively stable blood mitochondrial copy number. If you look at the affected patients, and they're trying to compensate for the chronic defect by increasing the copy number. But what's amazing is that the people that don't go blind are homozygous, homoplasmic for the mutation, have almost twice as much mitochondrial DNA copy number. So what we have here is the compensation for a chronic defect by an increase in copy number. And those people that can't make this uh, appropriate compensation can ultimately go blind. So we wanted to prove that this kind of mutation causes the disease. And so we decided to make a mouse uh, that had a mitochondrial complex one disease mutation. This is a ND6 instead of ND4, but still the same enzyme. And it's the same mutation that you see in patients with optic atrophy and serious childhood disease called Lee syndrome, as we mentioned. So uh, we mutagenized cell, mouse cell cultures. We isolated a mouse cell culture with exactly the same amino acid change, proline 5 leucine. We removed the nucleus. We took the cytoplasmic fragment. We made a female preprint embryonic stem cell, removed its mitochondria, fused in the mutant mitochondria, put it into a blastocyst, put it into a foster mother, chimeras and transmitted mutant mitochondria into female mouse germline. And this then creates the same kind of thing that um, Francesca mentioned, about a 50 to 60 percent reduction in the specific activity of complex one. And that means that there's going to be a buildup of NADH because it cannot be rapidly oxidized. And so now you can use something called uh, NADH um, fluorescence lifetime uh, imaging microscopy or FLIM, and you can look at the brain of these mice to see if in fact there's more NADH. And the orange color indicates that there is a much higher NADH in the mutant than in the control. And you can see that there's uh, the ratio of NAD to NADH is much lower. Even more interesting is if you look at these um, mice um, brain cells and also tissue, you find high mitochondrial ROS production. But what's interesting is, as uh, Francesca mentioned, these mice make ROS in the forward direction, but they do not make ROS in the, re uh, in the reverse direction. And it is now felt from the people in Ca um, Cambridge, England, that in fact, this mouse drives the mutation into this inactive form, uh, the D form that Francesca was mentioning. If you look at the neurons of these mice, they have swollen axons, they have abnormal mitochondria, this is mutant, this is control, and they have a neurodegenerative disease. We can then look at uh, mitochondrial neurodegenerative disease by looking at the eye, and this is called uh, uh, electroretinograms, and you flash the light in the eye, and then you get one response, then another response, and then the length of response. The point is that in two different mouse models that we now have, one with the clear reverse electron flux damage, but the other not, we see reduction in both mice in the response to the light flash. So they have effects on the nerve transmission uh, of the uh, optic nerve. But what was really interesting is when we took the ND6 mouse and we then looked at its behavior, Amazingly enough, it has a semi-antisocial behavior. It would rather interact with an inanimate rock than it would with an unknown mouse. And uh, this uh, is uh, very characteristic of this animal. It also has a um, striking uh, anxiety phenotype. If you put it in an elevated, um, what we call zero maze, which is an elevated track of high above the floor, the mouse will cower in the area where it's protected from the uh, seeing the uh, open space, whereas a normal mouse will venture out and uh, move around on this uh, circular maze. And if you ask the mouse um, to uh, see if it's rather compulsive, mice love to bury things, then a normal mouse gets tired of it. So we put 13 marbles into a cage, it'll bury about uh, five to six and then give up. The ND6 mice will bury all the marbles. And if you then look at the electroencephalographic result uh, of these animals, what you see is a very striking reduction in both the delta and the theta waves of the EEG, which are very characteristic of autism. So that then 
got us interested in looking at another autism disease, which is the deletion on chromosome 22, originally called the George syndrome. Now it's just called 22Q11 uh, deletion syndrome. What's interesting about this um, particular deletion is it removes a number of critical mitochondrial enzymes. And that alters the array of expression of mitochondrial uh, genes uh, that all interact with these particular proteins. And this particular disease can have two phenotypes. It can either present with autism or a more severe schizophrenia. And what we now have shown is that the relationship between schizophrenia and autism relates to the mitochondrial DNA copy number, just as in labors. So if we now look at the um, schizophrenic uh, patient cell lines, and these are all neurons that have been made in culture from iPS cells, you see a reduction in ATP, a reduction in complex one, a reduction in complex four. And if you look at um, then specific aspects of mitochondrial function, you see that the schizophrenia uh, cell lines, uh, neurons, have reduced ATP, they have reduced complex five, they have reduced nuclear encoded complex one subunits, reduced mitochondrial DNA encoded subunits. And if you then look at the uh, non-schizophrenic, the ATP level is partially restored, even though some of these other factors are the same. And what that is, is the increase in copy number of the mitochondrial DNA in the non-schizophrenic um, uh, deletion patients. And that's related to the upregulation of a protein called PGC1-alpha, which is a master transcriptional regulator. So the difference between whether you get schizophrenia or autism is depends entirely on mitochondrial DNA copy number. So how can you then take advantage of this observation? Well, you could use an agonist of PGC1-alpha. This is called benzofibrate. And when we add benzofibrate to these cultures, we can almost double the ATP production and um, we can increase the uh, PGC1-alpha level and uh, also mitochondrial DNA transcription. But another interesting thing that can be done is there are microRNAs that inhibit uh, the expression of nuclear encoded mitochondrial genes. And so if we use an antagomer that blocks these microRNAs, we can again, increase the ATP level, increase PGC1-alpha and increase mitochondrial DNA transcription. So now this suggests that we have both gene transfer and as well as pharmacological approaches to look at these complex neurological diseases. So um, I just wanted to mention before I stop, these are all the people that the, uh, uh, the studies on autism in the mouse, uh, Al, Anna, Megan, and uh, my long-term co colleague, um, Eric Marsh, and all the work that was done on uh, 22Q um, is Jim Ping Lee and Stuart Anderson, and of course, our lab team that makes this possible. I just wanted to take this moment to show that there is really broad-based opportunities now applying the ideas that Hazel and Francesca have mentioned to a wide variety of different clinical syndromes that up till now have seemed to be uh, un un difficult to understand and difficult to treat. So now we can have questions. And uh, one of the questions that came up, uh, which I think was kind of fun, um, let's go back here. Uh, well, basically, the question is, if, if you can transfer uh, bacteria, why can't you transfer mitochondria? And who wants to answer that question? Hazel? Uh, Francesca? Hazel, go ahead, or Doug. Or okay. Well, <laughs> I, I'm happy to tell you what I know. Uh, in fact, there are many efforts to try to transfer mitochondria. Uh, it, it's being done uh, in patients after a myocardial infarction. Uh, it's being done for osteoarthritis with direct injection of mitochondria into the joint. Uh, what's really interesting, Doug, is that these are the many of these labs have also worked with stem cell transfer, so mesenchymal stem cell transfer. Uh, and my my uh, collaborator at Cornell University has actually found that when they transfer mesenchymal stem cells. The way it works is that those healthy mesenchymal stem cells transfer their mitochondria to the disease chondrocytes. So I think mitochondria transfer is going to be a reality. Um, and there are groups that have actually tried to combine mitochondria transfer with SS31. I don't know, no insight into what they do, but they're trying. Great. We have another question from near Barzilia. 
And maybe he can ask that himself since I see he's uh, uh, come on uh, visually. Can you unmute your um, microphone and ask your question? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I couldn't unmute for a second. Yeah, I, I just want to point out that uh, metformin has many effects, um, oh. some of them not through AMP kinase and some of them not through mitochondria. There's experiments with uh, row zero cells that Doug kind of invented that showed lots of histone actions. And, and, and the point is, we don't know for aging, for longevity, which is the important part of metformin's actions. So I wouldn't take for granted that it's complex one that's going to recapitulate that. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, again, Nir, I wanted to point out everybody has their own favorite, uh, you know, hypothesis and targets. Uh, that's what we're exploring now, because again, uh, you know, it's by eliminating complex one in certain uh, model diseases that you can say whether a drug works or not. So we're in the process of doing that so far so good. Uh, but, you know, a dog has a lot of mitochondrial DNA mutation and disease models, like a lot of mice that had very important mutation that are causative of disease, or this inborn error of disease. And so that's what we're exploring, because as, as soon as you have a drug that, you know, cor cor corrects that uh, defect in complex one, then you can make the argument sure. Um, but again, you know, it's a starting point, And uh, that's, that's what we do. Can I have a follow up question, if I may? Um, sure. You, you know, we have this discussion. There are lots of people who think that metformin actually doesn't really enter, doesn't accumulate in a near complex one. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and I think maybe it's true in, in uh, acute experiments, but, but metformin might accumulate with time also. W what is your view of uh, how does metformin, if metformin gets there, we get lots of pushback. Like you mean tissues or in mitochondria? Like, into uh, into the mitochondria. In, yeah. In well, so so again, one of the main uh, questions we always have to address when uh, you know uh, talking about metformin is that it requires this transporters, right? And um, so the OCTs or the mates in the kidney, in the liver, in the gut. So if you have a compound that is similar to metformin, you're not going to get it anywhere other than those tissues first and foremost. So as far as the accumulation, the best experiments would be, would be to actually isolate mitochondria from the tissue and do quantitative measurements that nobody has ever done yet. So what you can do now is to take the liver after metformin exposure and you have the overall amount of, of, of the metformin in the liver or in other tissues. So those are experiments that we haven't done yet, but um, you know, there, is, there is evidence that it actually accumulates in the liver for that very reason because it transports there. And there is evidence, clear evidence that it accumulates in the gut, in the colon, and this is where, and in the kidney again. And this is where all this um, evidence points to the fact that yes, metformin is limited. Can we find drugs that don't, do not require these transporters that will still accumulate and have reached mitochondrial complex one? So that's what we're working on. I don't have the answers to that right now, but that's exactly what we're doing in the company. Um, so. Terrific. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, there's a question for Hazel from Thomas, um, and he asks, uh, uh, is anyone working on targeting MAMS and or interact, interaction between Sting and MOPS? I guess that's uh, on relation to SS31. I, no, I, I am not aware uh, of studies that involve uh, that, that going down the pathway uh, of, of Sting, uh, but you know, so we, we've thought about this, uh, and there are many drugs that target downstream of cardiolipin peroxidation. So you can hit any one of the downstream pathways uh, and get some defects. Mm -hmm. And we just thought that, you know, it would be ideally most effective if you go upstream and just prevent, protect that bacteria, that prehistoric bacteria. We want to protect it without exposing it to the cells. Fantastic. Um, uh, do anybody else want to raise their hand? Uh, we'd love to hear from other people. Um, we have a, a nice comment from uh, Nigeria, um, and uh, that's Benizer. Uh, and Doug, Doug, I'm sorry, can I uh, pass through? I know we are down to the last couple of minutes. I was looking at uh, Gordon Cutler's question in the Q&A, human basal and total energy expenditure adjusted for fat-free mass decreased progressively from age 60 to 80. 
it's a science quote, uh, a citation. Is this because failing mitochondria are starving cells of needed energy, supply failure, or because failing cells like oxidation, mutation, epigenetics, et cetera, are less able to use energy, demand failure, supply failure, demand failure? I'm going to leave that to Hazel or uh, Francesca. Well, then, then it's going to be Hazel because I would leave it to either Hazel or Doug. <laughs> well, there's clearly uh, a decline uh, in energy uh, production with age. Uh, and we actually found out that using oat mice, that it's pretty clear that the, the ATP de decline is due to a proton leak. So this is a leaky in a membrane problem. So we know that, but it's, it, I cannot address uh, the, the other side of the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, uh, Doug I, and panelists, that was unbelievable. It's fabulous. Uh, and I, I urge everybody to tell everybody about this uh, session and we'll have it uh, re a recording posted at the Catalis Institute. Uh, I wish we couldn't end this, could go on. I'd love to listen for, uh, for many more hours, but we do have to go to the next uh, presentation. So I want to thank Doug and Hazel and Francesca and uh, thank you. Thank up you the, the next panel, please. And uh, uh, Nir was here. Asked, sorry, go ahead, Doug. I just want to thank Thomas and, uh, all, uh, and Zan and all the colleagues at Ken Nexum for uh, letting us have this wonderful meeting together.